is Jesus to you? That's such a perfect question for the book of John. Within each story, John seems to attempt to answer the question, answer this question over and over again with different responses. Jesus is God. Jesus is active. Jesus is courageous. Jesus is bread. Jesus is light. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the good shepherd. Those words almost seem too familiar, don't they? Jesus is the good shepherd. Can you envision the picture of Jesus with the lamb around his neck? It seemed to be in every church basement growing up. Or the ones where Jesus stands at the gate and the sheep kind of enter in. Jesus is the good shepherd. This is a phrase that for those in the first century would have been reminded immediately to look back to Ezekiel 34 where the prophet laments that the shepherds have left the sheep vulnerable and unfed and disadvantaged, all while they are overfed, secure, and reaping the benefits of what the sheep have to offer. The situation is dire. Their actions do not reflect the will of God as they, the will of the God they represent. The prophet announces those who think they are the shepherd are no more the ones who lead, who care, and who watch over the flock. And their lack of care has left God with no other choice than to step in, to lean in, to come close, and shepherd the flock themselves. The prophet speaks for God when he says, I will rescue my flock. Jesus' arrival on the Galilean and Judean scene in the Gospel of John has caused a stir. He is nothing like what the Messiah is supposed to be. In fact, he is quite opposite. He is woefully inept at defying Rome in any kind of meaningful way, yet equally seems opposed to the means of the emperor. His language about kingdom is bound to get the attention of the king, bound to get the attention of the empire, and they sense it could be dangerous. And his ideas about what God is like, and thus what they should be like, are alarming. He dismisses the foundational pieces and parts that have made them a people and a nation, ones known for their connection to God. The way... Jesus discards and dismantles their traditions is one thing, but the ways the crowds hang on to his every word, even those that seem like heresy and blasphemy, that is what feels unforgivable. Jesus seems to be taking that which has sustained them away from them, the breath that has propped them up, the thinking that has kept them powerful, the ideas that have kept them safe, that have kept them in and others out, Jesus seems to trample over all of it. Jesus isn't protecting the things that they believe need to be protected. He isn't insisting on the things they believe need to be insisted on. Jesus is threatening the very system that created them, the very system that sustains them. And it is moments after Jesus heals a man born blind that the Pharisees approach Jesus yet again. His capacity to render healing does not match with their ideas of who Jesus is or what Jesus should be about. To heal the way he does seems to symbolize that he is from God. But his teachings, his upheaval of systems, his unraveling of traditions make them wonder if he is not more of a heretic. Who is Jesus to you? They see him, but they completely miss him. They are the very shepherds described in Ezekiel that choose their own life rather than the life of the sheep. And Jesus pronounces that these religious leaders, so quick to miss out on who he is, that they are guilty because they suggest that they can see that they have the answers, that they possess the way when they are actually blind. The atrocity of the blind leading the sheep all while announcing they can see is the great danger that Jesus opposes as he echoes the sentiments of the prophet Ezekiel when he spoke the words of God. I will rescue my flock. I am the good shepherd. Jesus describes the good shepherd as one who willingly sacrifices themselves for the sheep. <coughs> 
He describes it like this, when danger comes towards the sheep, the good shepherd willingly stands between that which would harm them, that which would destroy them, and the sheep itself. He compares this to that of a hired hand who would easily abandon the sheep when trouble comes, seeking to first save themselves. The good shepherd seeks not just to keep the sheep from danger, but also seeks to ensure that the sheep has a rich, satisfying, abundant life, even if it requires him to willingly give up his own life for the sake of the sheep. Jesus describes himself by saying, I am the good shepherd. But who is Jesus to you? In John chapter 8, um, within most translations, you find this little caveat, this asterisk, uh, notation. And that notation might leave us to imagine that the next several verses are not supposed to be taken seriously or considered valuable or perhaps to be considered anything other than a tall tale to help John sell more of his issues of the gospel. But the reality is this tiny passage of scripture, um, uh, starting chapter 7, verse 52, to chapter 8, verse 12, is found in different places and in different manuscripts. So the notations are less an assumption of the passage being invalid and is more an acknowledgement that the various scribes and scholars aren't quite agreed on where this story best fits. Who said it first? Who wrote it first? But the story nestled between Jesus at the festival of Sukkot and Jesus nearly stoned to death at the end of chapter 8 holds this almost perfect picture of Jesus as shepherd. The religious are frustrated as they try to untangle and unravel the answer to the question, who is Jesus? So far, he has been nothing more than a problem to solve, a fire to douse, a radical to eliminate, whether by destroying his public image or ensuring that he's killed. In this moment, they opt for the first as they drag a woman who we can suspect from the the text was found in some kind of illicit entanglement with a man who is not her husband. But the challenge with this moment is not that this woman is known for, as known as having committed adultery. The challenge with this moment is that no one really cares about this woman. No one is concerned about this woman. No one wonders why or how she has found her way into this position. And we equally know that the man she was with is nowhere to be found. Did he save himself? Did he throw her to the proverbial wolves? Was it a setup designed to entrap her? Entrap her? Entrap her? <laughs> Had they been wondering and waiting and watching to find her, waiting to use her? So the specifics aren't clear, but as they drag this woman with all of her shame and fear, and they call it some an insecurity, they drag her right before Jesus. They see her as nothing more than this unrighteous pawn in their so-called holy game. I want you to imagine her, her body shivering, fear coiling itself around her neck. Shame sinking into her stomach. She is an almost invisible playing piece. But the good shepherd sees her. He sees her fear. He sees her shame. He sees her sin. He sees her standing diminished in the community, her standing diminished among the crowds. He sees the judgment heaped upon her as she stands before him, dust and tears clothing her, hastily grabbed garments covering her, desperation flooding over her. Her sins are presented to the rabbi as her sins are laid bare before the crowds. The religious wear their moral superiority, their gotcha smiles, and the law of Moses as they say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law says she should be stoned. What do you say? Jesus bends down and he begins to write in the sand, his silence deafening and somehow maddening. And they ask again and again, what do you say? They demand an answer and Jesus stands up. 
And he says something along the lines, whichever of you have followed the law perfectly, whichever of you have never committed sin, whichever of you have nothing that is negative on your roster, for all of you who are without error and without fault, for all of you who are sinless, you throw the first stone. You kill her, you destroy her, you devour her. And then Jesus crouches back down and begins to write in the sand. One by one, the accusers leave. No one can answer the question, and one by one, their stones hit the ground. The woman is left, unable to move, unsure of what's next, and the crowds look on. And Jesus asks the question, did anyone accuse you? And her voice, as small as a whisper, says, no, and Jesus says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus, the good shepherd, saves her from the ones who are akin to the hired hands. Jesus, the good shepherd, finds her vulnerable and disadvantaged and insists, I will rescue my flock. Where the law spoke certain death over her, Jesus offers her unexpected life. Where the religious threw her in front of the wolves, certain she was nothing more than collateral damage, Jesus stands between her and that which seeks to destroy her, and he speaks life. Where the incessant power of sin wanted to consume her, Jesus insisted she was worthy. Worthy of forgiveness, worthy of being defended, worthy of being rescued, of being saved, of being acknowledged, worthy of a voice, worthy of a second chance, simply beautifully worthy. The religious were intended to be shepherds to the people, the shepherds of of a religion, the shepherds who led and guided a nation, a people to know and understand what God is like. But rather than pointing people towards God, they pointed people towards a religion. They pointed people towards a system. They pointed people towards tradition. Not with the intent of those pieces moving people to be more like God, but drawing people to be more like them, to be more like the religion, to be more like the systems, to be more like the tradition. And while it's easy for us to mistake that both the religion and the one the religion adores are synonymous, when the religion gets in the way of knowing God, when the religion gets in the way of people encountering God, when the religion gets in the way of us knowing God, then we can consider the religious to be nothing more than hired hands, nothing more than those seeking to save themselves, protect themselves, sustain themselves at the expense of the sheep. When I think about the modern church, I often wonder if our neighbors view us as the good shepherd, or if they would see us more so as the hired hand? Do they see us as ones who drag the woman into the crowds announcing her sins, or do they see us as the ones who stand between her and her accusers offering forgiveness? Perhaps how we are viewed, and even more so how our neighbors respond, is directly linked to how we answer the question, who is Jesus to you? This week, I listened in on um, a talk, um, a, and it was two different speakers, and the question they were answering was about how to do church or Christianity or something along those lines differently. And so the two speakers couldn't have been kind of more different. One spoke about the ways that God had shifted his thinking to engage his neighbors with vulnerability, to identify with them, to listen to their stories expanding tables in ways that Jesus did in the Gospels. And the other spoke with a really terrible song in the background that he was singing, and we were all trying so I was like, I'm so glad I'm not live, because I was laughing and laughing, because the song was so distracting. All right, so now you know. I don't have a pure heart, but it was really bad. <laughs> um, and, you know, he just thought it was so good. That was the worst, is he thought it was so good. <laughs> But the other one was speaking, and he was talking about ways to create and recreate an empire. Something that had to be sustained through the baiting of young people, the sleight of hands that offered friendship only to be a means as a way to an altar call. 
where to belong meant you had to conform. One spoke about caring for the sheep. The other spoke about building a program and establishing an institution and protecting their formulas. One seemed to know Jesus as one to sustain their religion, while the other seemed to know Jesus as one to sustain the sheep. Who is Jesus to you? One iteration ensures that our power is maintained and our traditions are sustained. Our institutions are engaged regardless of the needs of those who surround us. And another speaks of one who seeks to offer a satisfying, abundant life to all, even if it's costly, even if it means laying down the very things we once thought must sustain us. To better grasp how we see Jesus is perhaps the greatest test it's perhaps the greatest test is to imagine ourselves face to face with a woman caught in adultery. Her fate determined by how we see Jesus. Her fate determined by how we imagine Jesus holds our rules and our policies and our doctrines. Would we stone her according to the law? Or would we stand between her and those who accuse her, offering her a new way forward? a new perspective, a new hope, an invitation to redemption. And therein lies the reason why this question is so important. Hired hand or good shepherd, who is Jesus to you? This distinction does not simply affect our encounters with God. It doesn't simply affect the ways that we pray or the ways that we take communion or the ways that we gather or the ways that we listen, to, listen for the Spirit but they equally affect how we respond to our prayer, how we respond to communion, how we respond to what we are hearing from the Spirit, and then they affect how we engage our neighbors. They affect how we engage our neighborhoods, those that God has entrusted to us, those that God has called us as a collective and as individuals to be the church to and to be the church with. So who is Jesus to you. I'll invite the worship team to come up. Jesus is God who revealed to us love and faithfulness. Jesus is light. Jesus is active. Jesus is our courageous liberator. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the good shepherd. Who is he to you?